Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and I should start by thanking uh, Steve. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here today. When I accepted your invitation last year, I, I did so based on hope that I would have something to say. We just started the group last year. But uh, I'm glad to say that thanks to uh, uh, the dedicated effort of a really great team of co-workers, uh, we, we actually have things to talk about today. <laughs> so my group is a, is a synthetic chemistry group. Uh, we make new materials. And the, the theme behind our work is to make hybrid materials that have molecules as, as a part, so integrated at the atomic level with extended solids. And the, the reasoning behind this is quite simple. Um, solution state molecular chemists will often sing the praises of molecules. So in terms of precisely knowing what you have, in terms of structural definition, it's very hard to beat a molecular system, so a zero-dimensional system. We also have decades of, of synthetic chemistry knowledge, uh, just org through organic and metal organic chemistry, and we are able to fine tune the structure of molecules at a level of precision that we just cannot attain with solids. So for example, we can change a, a hydrogen atom to a fluorine atom at a specific carbon on an alkyl chain. We, we cannot yet do this with solids. So we, and, but also we are aware of the shortcomings of molecules. We know, for example, that solids have far superior thermal properties, mechanical strength. We know that solids have far more varied electronic structures. So instead of making compromises and choosing to work with molecules or working with solids, we envision hybrid materials that have components that behave like molecules and also have some spatial extension and have components that behave like solids. So we try to make these materials as a, a single phase material. And by this, I mean that we don't work with heterogeneous mixtures. We, we want one material that has components that, that behave like molecules and has components that behave like solids. Great. So uh, when I started my group last year, I wanted to start on somewhat familiar territory. So as an undergraduate student, I worked in Bob Carver's group at Princeton on metal oxide perovskites. And for my graduate and postdoctoral work, I, I moved to a different world. I worked uh, on molecules and solution state chemistry. So now that I'm back with solids, I, I still wanted to start with, with a familiar material. So instead of looking at metal oxide perovskites that require temperatures of about 1,500 degrees to synthesize, these are not conditions uh, amenable for using organic groups, we looked at metal halide perovskites that can be formed at room temperature. So I just want to take you very briefly through the, the perovskite structure. Uh, you can think of this as um, a cationic, I'm sorry, an, an, a, a negative framework comprised of metal, metal halide polyhedra. So each octahedron here has a, a divalent metal, so a two plus metal center at the center of each octahedron. And this is coordinated to six, six ligands, six bridging ligands. In this case, it's a halide. So X can be a chloride, bromide, or iodide. So this forms uh, uh, an extended 3D framework with a negative charge, and we need to, to add positive ions to ch for charge neutrality. And these positive ions are denoted as A plus here, and these just sit in a cavity defined by eight of these octahedra. So uh, this is uh, uh, solid state chemists and physicists have done many varied things with perovskites, but we wanted to look at these materials and incorporate organic groups into it. So that, that sounds like a, a great idea, but when you look at this material, you, you ask the question, how can I incorporate organic groups in, into this structure? You could swap out this uh, inorganic uh, A center here with, so instead of say cesium plus, you could put an organic group, but that's a very small cavity, so you really just don't have that much space. So we want to create more space. We do this by layering the material. So we go from a, a 3D material to a 2D material. And this is still the perovskite structure. You can derive these layers by simply slicing through this, this 3D material. And now you, you just get more space to put more elaborate organic groups. So this, this has been the focus of the, the work in the group for, for our first year. And the hybrid perovskites, or, or layered organic inorganic perovskites, have been known since the 1970s. Though more recently, David Mitzi's group at IBM has done some really beautiful work studying the electronic properties of this dimensionally reduced inorganic sheets. And he has incorporated these materials as organic inorganic electronics. So he has built diodes and transistors with these. And uh, David Mitzi's work has really, we've, we've used this as a stepping stone for, for almost everything we've done in the group. So this is why we love these materials. These are well-defined materials. These are crystalline, and chemists love crystalline materials because we can grow single crystals, 
of these materials and we can use X-ray diffraction to know the precise at atomic structure and connectivity of these solids. So it, it's a hybrid material where we have just perfect structural definition. Uh, it's also a, a really neat way to, to access dimensionally reduced inorganic structures within a bulk material. So you have heard of quantum dots and quantum wires. These, are very, these materials have very unique electronic properties, but the way you access these properties is using very complicated processing techniques. When you have sheets or, or chains as a part of a bulk crystalline structure, the, the organic groups will isolate these sheets such that th these materials will actually act like quantum confined inorganic structures, but these are much easier to synthesize. These structures are, are highly tunable. We can change this red sphere here, the metal 2 plus. We can change the halide. We can change the connectivity of this inorganic sheet. We can change the thickness of the sheet. And of course, we have all the, you know, this vast structural and functional diversity of organic groups to put in as the R group here. And of course, the idea is to make a material that, behave, that shows properties of molecules and also shows properties of inorganic solids. But uh, what I find even more fascinating is that the synergistic effects of having these molecular centers and inorganic solids can give rise to new properties in the hybrid that are not inherent to the, to the parent components. These are synthesized in water or in inorganic solvents at room temperature and pressure. These are extremely mild conditions compared to conditions of typical solid state synthesis. And we can deposit films of these materials on various substrates using solution state chemistry. So we can simply dip a wafer into a solution and coat that wafer with, with these materials. We can use drop casting, spin coating, and other extremely cheap techniques. And I wanted to highlight how we make these materials because it's tempting to think about layer by layer deposition techniques when you see a layered material. This is not what we do, that, that's too hard. So we just throw everything into solution. So in solution, just in, in in a beaker on, your, on the bench, we have all these precursors floating around, and we ask these, these metal ions and these organic linkers to form this very ordered structure. So what I'm trying to show with this picture is that there are hundreds of other things that could form, and we allow self-assembly to dictate the structure we want. So the, the challenge of self-assembly is that we need to sample a very large reaction space and find the correct conditions such that the, this, sorry, this whole bunch of this, this big mess here will actually form this beautiful ordered structure. But the beauty of self-assembly is that once you identify these conditions to make the layered structure, you can make the same structure each time you, you do it. So it's ideally reproducible, and it's also a very nice way to get the, the same inorganic structure each time. So the, the thickness of the inorganic layers and the organic layers is dictated by the crystal structure. So it's just perfectly reproducible. There is no size distribution between syntheses. So today I will tell you about, uh, I'll tell you two brief stories about uh, studies that we very recently finished in the group as of yesterday. So this is <laughs> very recent news. Uh, and I, I think this beautifully shows the, the strength of the hybrid platform. The, the first study I'll tell you about has uh, what I like to call action at the organic layer, and the second study will talk about action at the inorganic layer. So the first, first study was done by Dr. Diego solis Sibara. He's a postdoctoral scholar in my group. And Diego found uh, this really neat way to capture gases from airstreams using a non-porous material. This is unusual because typically gas capture materials are porous. I mean, where would the substrates go? But we found that these materials expand dramatically to incorporate substrates, and we also found that we can release these substrates. And uh, for the second part of my talk, I'll talk about uh, Emma Donner's work. Emma is a junior at Stanford, and she's, working in, she's worked in my group for two years now. And Emma found a way to stabilize uh, uh, these corrugated inorganic sheets instead of these flat sheets. And she found that these are very promising as, as white light emitters, so phosphors for solid state lighting devices. And it's very unusual for one single phase bulk material to emit white light, which corresponds to all the wavelengths in, in the visible spectrum. And I'll tell you about that uh, towards the end. So when I started my group last year, I just asked my group to put anything that fits into the organic layer. I just wanted to see what, what we could form. So you know the, the goals were somewhat low initially. We just wanted to see if we could make these layered materials. So in the process of making a, a more elaborate linker, Diego formed this, uh, this alkyl chain with a terminal alkyne group. 
So chemists have a very nasty habit of not showing hydrogens. Uh, this might look a little odd, but this is simply a carbon-carbon triple bond that's hanging at the end of an alkyl chain. So we made this, this uh, hybrid, uh, well, Diego made this hybrid material with lead bromide sheets with dangling uh, organic linkers uh, between the sheets. And uh, if you look at this material, it's completely non-porous. So here, so every picture I show you is from a single crystal X-ray structure. So we can grow single crystals of these materials, and this, these are the precise atomic positions of the materials. So if you look at the space filling model, you see that this, the organic groups form a very densely packed layer, and there is no space within this material. But if you open up a freshman organic chemistry book, I think somewhere in the first few chapters, you find that, that alkyne groups, so carbon-carbon so triple bonds, will react with halogens like chloride, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and, and those halogens will add across the bonds. So because the solution state chemistry of triple bonds with iodine was known, we were just curious to see whether iodine could react with this solid state material. And I think we just did this because we could. But uh, we, we exposed this crystalline solid to iodine vapor, just in a beaker. It's a very simple experiment. We were really surprised to find that the entire material gets iodinated. So iodine vapor adds across this triple, triple, uh, triple bond to form this double bond with two iodines. So it forms chemical bonds within this material. What's really remarkable about this transformation is that the crystallinity of the material remains. So initially, you have this partially interdigitated organic layer that looks a bit like this. And the whole material just swells only in one direction. And the swelling is huge. It's about 40% of the parent structure. And it's really remarkable that this maintains the crystallinity. This is the largest reported unit cell expansion for a crystalline material. So this was neat. And we, we, as chemists, you know, we get excited over things like this. But I, I didn't actually think there was a use for this. But we were pleased to find out after the fact that uh, there's actually a need to capture iodine gas from air. So it turns out that uh, nuclear power plants emit radioactive iodine as a, as a final oxidation product of uh, uranium and plutonium fuel. And initially, from these power plants will emit a whole bunch of different isotopes of iodine, so five to 10 different isotopes of iodine. And many of these have very short lifetimes. So if you let this nuclear fuel sit for about a week, you're left with just two isotopes. So I-127 is the stable isotope, and that's not a problem. But iodine-129 is a problem. So this is a gamma and beta emitter and has a half-life of 10 million years. And iodine is a gas. So we have a radioactive gas that lives for 10 million years. So there's, there's a lot of interest in capturing this material. Iodine, <laughs> iodine is especially nasty because it can very easily get into the food chain and get into waterways. And uh, any iodine that we consume ends up in our thyroid. And there are strong correlations between this and thyroid cancers. So there's a lot of interest, especially in government labs, for, for creating a material that can capture iodine as a solid state product. And the idea is to bury it somewhere safe for 10 million years. I'm not sure what's safe for 10 million years, but uh, we certainly need to make iodine a non-volatile material through this capture material. There's also uh, some developmental work on nuclear transmutation, where you can capture all that iodine in a solid state material and zap it with radiation and convert it into a, a, less, uh, to a stable isotope which sounds safer to me. So we, we looked at this material in terms of an iodine capture uh, agent, and it, it actually performs quite well. So if you look at the gravimetric capacity for iodine capture of this material, that is just how much iodine does it capture, so amount of iodine captured divided by amount of iodine plus uh, weight of the capture material, we get a weight capacity of 43%. If we look at the highest reported numbers for iodine capture materials, we get 64% and 55% in metal organic frameworks. But these frameworks are, are porous structures. So it's, it's quite impressive that a non-porous material has, has comparable weight capacities to porous materials. Now, for this specific purpose, we don't care so much about gravimetric capacity. You're not going to carry this iodine with you. So what really matters is volumetric capacity. And in terms of volumetric capacity, a non-porous structure will always win. So these materials have the highest volumetric capacities uh, reported for iodine capture materials. And just to give you an idea of what's out there, right now, most government labs at Sandia and, um, and Idaho 
uh, are studying silver impregnated zeolites. So zeolites are, are porous metal oxide frameworks and the, these pores can be lined with silver nanoparticles. So the idea is that when iodine goes through, it just reacts with the silver, forms silver iodide, which is a solid. But, but we calculated the highest possible weight capacities of these materials and they have to be below 33%. So these numbers are, are better than the current technologies. So this looks great, but a question arises. Here, the iodine capture occurs at the organic layer, so why, why make the hybrid? Why not use the organic molecule on its own? So we asked that question, and we did a series of experiments where we assessed the activity of the organic molecule alone versus the, the hybrid perovskite. And we found that there are many reasons to make the hybrid material. So the, these organic groups on their own are extremely hygroscopic. It will just dissolve at, at ambient humidity and just form a puddle uh, on your bench. And, uh, Stability to moisture is important for capturing radioactive iodine because the waste streams are saturated with water. So your capture material cannot dissolve in the waste stream. Uh, and in contrast, the hybrid perovskite that we make with these, with these groups can be stored on, on the benchtop for, for months and is stable at even very high relative humidities. In terms of thermal stability, all the hybrid materials we've made are at least 50 degrees more stable, sorry, st stable to at least 50 degrees higher temperatures than the organic groups alone, and these are all stable up to about 200 degrees Celsius, if not more. These waste streams also have more NOx gases than iodine, so NOx is NO and NO2, and the organic groups will typically react with NOx, and it will simply get deactivated if you use the organic group alone. But what we found is that if you put these organic groups in the hybrid perovskite, it has a far greater resistance to reactivate with NOx gases, and selectively binds just iodine. We also found out that something rather cool, which is that you know, lead shields are used as radiation shields. So we calculated if we did capture radioactive iodine in the organic groups, can the inorganic sheets actually shield that, that radiation? So we calculated the adsorption for both the for both the gamma radiation and the beta radiation emitted from radioactive iodine, and we found that using the, the hybrid material is uh, far better than using the organic group, which is not surprising because the lead bromide sheets have, uh, have so much electron density. And the, the, uh, the hybrid material will absorb that radiation 100 times better than the organic group alone. So right now, we think that we can make, use these materials to capture iodine in a very soft organic matrix. And we can actually use the inorganic sheets, sheet, sheets to, to shield some of the radiation, at least, that is emitted from the iodine. And remember, we form covalent bonds, so these are very strong linkages between iodine and carbon, so that iodine is not going to come off. What we need to assess, though, is the binding enthalpies of these materials. The, the challenge with capturing radioactive iodine is that there's very low concentration of iodine in these waste streams, so we're talking parts per million. So we need to, either to increase the mixing efficiency of the gas and the solid, such that the, the solid will constantly be able to capture this gas, or we need to get a material with very high binding enthalpies, and that this is planned for the future. So this was reactivity with triple bonds. We then moved to reactivity with double bonds. So the solution state reactions of a double bond carbon with iodine leads to iodine again addition across this double bond, but this reaction now is reversible. So we were interested to see if the solid state material will also capture iodine reversibly. And we found that it does. So this is an x-ray pattern that just shows that this material can get iodinated and it will lose that iodine. So you can see that the morphology of the crystals are actually maintained as iodine comes on and off. So this material just breeds iodine in and out. So in solution, the reaction of iodine with alkene groups will, will form the diiodoalkane and this will live for about one hour. In the solid state, we have this very large network of iodine-iodine interactions, which we don't have in solution. So we can use this to stabilize the iodinated material. And this allows us to, to form time-released capture materials. So using crystal engineering, we were able to change the lifetime of this iodinated material from three hours all the way up to three days. And uh, um, a time to release capture material is an interesting way to regenerate your capture material free of charge. So you can imagine 
using the capture material, having that iodine flow come in, and then engineering the material such that it holds the iodine for three days. And during this time, you can just transport it to your sequestration uh, facility and just allow the iodine to be released. And now you have regenerated your capture material. And it's also, uh, it can also be used for sustained release of iodine. Iodine is a potent antiseptic. And iodine is often used to disinfect air streams and for medical applications. So, and the final thing we looked at is, again, you know, pulling out uh, organic chemistry books. We are inorganic chemists, so we don't know much organic chemistry. But these are very simple reactions. Um, we, we know that the addition of bromine across double bonds is not reversible, even though the addition of iodine is reversible. So indeed, we found that if we add bromine to these materials, we form the dibromoalkane, and this is not reversible. So this is actually a nice way to remove small amounts of bromine from an iodine stream. And this is important because iodine is an essential nutrient. Bromine is toxic to our bodies. And everywhere you get iodine, you get a small amount of bromine because it's very hard to separate iodine and bromine. These have very, very similar chemical properties. So what we can do is use these materials, which will reversibly bind iodine and irreversibly bind bromine, to remove trace amounts of bromine from iodine streams, which, which sounds useful. <laughs> So uh, that's uh, activity at the organic layer. Now I want to change gears and tell you about Emma's work on uh, synthesizing, again, hybrid perovskites that are white light emitters. And I'll give you a, a very brief background into why you, you would want to make phosphors for solid state lighting. So as, as you all probably know, the, the typical um, incandescent bulbs that we use, the tungsten filament bulbs, as well as fl fluorescent lamps, are just inherently e inefficient. And there's a lot of interest in moving to solid state lighting. And this transition has been projected to reduce the electricity used for lighting by, by about half by the year 2025. So there's a, a lot of interest in developing these light emitting diodes and phosphors that are required for solid state lighting. So the way that white light is generated using solid state lighting devices is to use is to couple a, a light emitting diode, an LED, with some phosphor. So the LED will excite the phosphor, and the phosphor will emit some radiation. And together, this must appear white to our eye. So there are two ways currently explored to do this. You could imagine a blue LED coated with a yellow phosphor. And the idea is that some of the blue, blue emission is allowed to penetrate through the LED such that the blue and the yellow will combine to appear white to our eye. And uh, this, this gives uh, a decent white light, and it's no problem if uh, you're just reading black text on, on, on a white sheet of paper. But this has very poor color rendition. So a red does not look red to, uh, to using this light. So you can imagine applications where color rendition is, is, is important. If you're, a, if you're a surgeon doing an operation, you know, blood must appear red. You must be able to distinguish internal organs. So there are cases when, when this light will, will not do. Uh, another strategy is to mix phosphors. So you can imagine uh, an ultraviolet LED hitting three different phosphors, a red, green, and blue phosphor. And together, this emission could look white. This also has problems, because when you have three phosphors, the emission of one phosphor might overlap with the excitation of another phosphor. What this means is that the emitted light of one phosphor will just be reabsorbed by another phosphor instead of contributing to the white light. And this causes inherent energy losses. It's also, because you have three phosphors, it's extremely unlikely that all three will degrade at the same rate. So even though you start with a white light, this light will get colored over time, as some of the phosphors decay faster than the others. So for these reasons, uh, there's a, a lot of interest in a single phase, so one emitter which degrades at one rate, um, broadband emitter. So a single phase means, means one emitter, and a broadband emitter that, that emits throughout the entire visible spectrum, such that you also get good color rendition. And this is a major target in solid state research. <coughs> so Emma was studying uh, directed self-assembly of hybrid perovskites. She wanted to see what kinds of organic groups will template different connectivities of the inorganic sheets. And what she found is that you could use two very similar organic groups. And the difference between these two groups is just the length of this alkyl chain between the nitrogens. 
And she, she found out that if she threw this into solution with lead bromide, she made this material which has flat sheets. And if she threw this organic cation with lead bromide into solution, she made these highly corrugated sheets. So this was kind of neat that we could make two very different structures using very similar precursors. And we just wanted to see what was different between these two materials. So she looked at the optical properties of these materials. And she, she measured the absorption and the emission spectrum of this material. And what she finds is uh, something that's not surprising. This is already documented in the literature. The absorption band shows this very strong exciton binding energy. This is characteristic of dimensionally reduced solids. And then you, you get a band gap because this is a high band gap semiconductor. If you look at the emission spectrum, you get a very sharp emission band. And this material appears blue. So this is just a film of this material on a slide. We irradiate it at, at about 400 nanometers, and it emits blue. And th there are no surprises here. But then she moved to, to the corrugated material, and she did the same experiment. And we were really surprised to find out that this glows white. So the absorption spectrum looks very similar. Again, you get the exciton band and, and the band gap. But the emission traverses the entire visible spectrum, so from 400 to 700 nanometers. So this is very unusual in, in a single material, in a, in a bulk material. So she, she looked at the, the color produced by this white light. So you, and this is defined by the CIE coordinates shown here. And what she found is that this material looks, is pretty close to the emission of, of just sunlight and dune. So if I, if I sh focus on this inset, in orange I show you the emission spectrum of the sun. And we have just co uh, colored in yellow the, the visible region. And this red line here shows the emission of uh, MR's first generation material. And if you look at this chromaticity diagram here, we are right here in this shaded red box. So there's a significant red component in, in this white light. And that's actually exactly what you want. Um, this produces a, a warm white light, which is, which is perfect for internal illumination. But she also found that you can tune the, the emission. So she can change the amount of chloride and bromide she uses in this material. And she can make the, uh, a material that has the emission spectrum shown here in, the, in this black curve, which basically gives you a cold white light. So it's, it's important that we can tune the, the emission because the, the transition of existing lighting to solid state lighting requires tunability of the emission because there are certain applications where the, the specifications for the light have already been defined and must be met by the, replace, the solid state replacements. She also found that the color rendition is very high. So because this is a broadband emission, red looks red and doesn't look brown. And the CRI values for our materials are, are above 80. And for any indoor application, you want CRI values of above 80. It's actually quite close to this mixed phosphors, but without the disadvantages of mixed phosphors. Uh, we looked at the origin of the broadband emission, and these are ongoing studies. The lifetime of the emission across the entire range from 400 to 700 nanometers is about the same, which this tells us that a similar excited state uh, emits to, to give this broad emission. Uh, I want to thank Eric uh, in material science uh, for helping us take these uh, lifetime measurements. And we have a collaborator at the Max Planck Institute, uh, Bing Hai, and he has done some very nice uh, electronic structure calculations, and our, which have really guided our thinking here. And we think that this is due to excited electrons that are trapped through elastic lattice deformations. So as, as the material vibrates, it traps the excited electrons, which decays radiatively to, to give this broad emission. Um, so I want to, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go a little quickly here. But I just want to tell you where we stand with respect to the shortcomings of, uh, with respect to current technologies. I mentioned previously that if you have um, a blue LED and a yellow phosphor, you, you don't get great color rendition. So if you look at this emission spectrum, there is very little red in, in the spectrum. So it's great for illuminating black and white, but not very good for for illuminating colors. And also, these materials are made at temperatures of about 1,300 to 1,900 degrees, so very high temperature synthesis. The emerging technologies involve using three different phosphors to generate white light. And uh, again, I told you previously that this has problems with self-absorption and different degradation rates of the phosphors. There are two new emerging technologies. They both involve cadmium, which is not great. Cadmium is, is toxic. But it is interesting to note that uh, these quantum dots that are very, very small, so quantum dots in the 1 to 2 nanometer size scale emit white light. And this is attributed to surface sites in these in very small structures. 
uh, and this has very nice color rendition. The problem is these materials, where these are tiny particles that have to be separated from each other. If they aggregate, the emission is quenched. So uh, along with developing this quantum dots, you also have to develop some kind of dispersive polymer that is resistant to degradation with the UV light. And uh, of course, no one really wants to work with cadmium in, in a large scale because of its toxicity. So uh, lead is not great for in terms of toxicity either, but cadmium is, is worse. We're unfortunately out of time. Sure, yeah. And uh, this is uh, also, the, the next emerging technology is also based on cadmium. So I just want to, I'll just leave you with this. This is a comparison of where we stand with respect to the, the current technologies. And we think it's, it's quite scalable, though we do need to improve the quantum efficiencies. I'm sorry, I think I just lost the slide. Did we lose your students? That was the most important part. That was the most important part. I should go back. We can't lose the students. That's important. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know how to get that back. I would like to end with that slide. But you want to get to the last slide? If you just put out the last slide, I I'm done talking. Thank you. So that's my group, uh, which you briefly saw. <laughs> and I just want to thank the following agencies for funding us. So. Perfect. Uh, yes. I'm really done talking. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>